Good afternoon, everyone. My name is That Chemist, and today I'm going to give you an introduction to organic chemistry, starting with the structure uh, of organic molecules as well as their functional groups. So you might be watching this video because you're taking an organic chemistry course, or you might just be curious about what's the big deal about chemistry. Like, is there reasons I should care about this? And hopefully I can convince you that, yes, you should care. Um, why? Because every day you consume products. We're consumers whether we like it or not. Even if we're not buying processed food, if we're making stuff from scratch, we're still interacting with molecules on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's important that we understand what those molecules do and why they're there. And so things that come to mind for me are, you look on the bottle of shampoo and you just wonder to yourself, like, what are all those ingredients? Even if you can read them, as an informed consumer, you should know what they are, what's their structure, what's their purpose. And hopefully through this course and some subsequent videos that I upload, um, I'll be able to help you guys walk your way through that. And so that you can make more informed choices for you, your family, uh, and for those around you. If you're cynical about that and you don't care what goes into your body, uh, just remember you are made of molecules. Uh, your molecule is being cynical about the value of your own body. And so, you know, I think it would be useful if we had a bit of respect for what we're made of. Um, so the purpose of this course isn't to replace a university course in organic chemistry. Um, it will potentially provide help that you might not get sufficiently from the course you're taking. Um, but I'm hoping that through these lectures, you at the very least learn something that could make your studies more easily. Or if you're not uh, currently enrolled in a course that it would just be an informative and interesting video for you. Uh, so some of the other things I want to do are like educate people, provide some experience uh, about what chemistry is, in case it's some mysterious complicated thing for you, hopefully the mystery can be resolved a bit. Um, and as I said before, I don't want to replace uh, university courses, they have a role, those systems are there for a good reason. If you are looking for a good textbook, um, here's three recommendations. Uh, the Clayton book is very good for physical chemistry explanations of uh, reactions. They also have very robust mechanisms that are superior to uh, other texts that are out there. Solomon's is a very approachable one that I used uh, when I took organic chemistry as an undergraduate student. Um, and if you're unable to get these texts for one reason or another, there's also a free online chemistry textbook from Libra Texts, and the link to that is shown here. Uh, if you're struggling with coursework, uh, it's often beneficial to seek help online. What you will find, though, is there's a lot of overwhelming information that's not pertinent to you as a student. If you're just trying to get your groundwork, basic level understanding of organic chemistry, uh, it may not be the best to just start Googling because you could get drowned in information. Now, if you're a researcher doing research, this can be very helpful. But as a student, uh, just starting organic chemistry, it might be a bit overwhelming. Um, also, so my main recommendation would just be to consult organic chemistry textbooks for the most part. Uh, you can also sometimes reach out to chemistry discords, especially if you follow any of the chemistry YouTube channels like Nile Red, Hamilton Morris, etc., there can be helpful people in those Discord sub-channels that might be willing to help you with some of your questions. Uh, but don't take advantage of them too much. If you need a lot of help, hire a tutor, someone who's reputable, that'll actually help you get your way through the course. So, let's begin. The first section we're going to talk about is the structures of organic molecules. I may deviate from the order that the textbooks that I discussed uh, present the material in, but I'm presenting it in a manner that I think is logical. And you can let me know in the comments if you think that I could do it a different way or you think there's a better way to go about doing it. So let's start off with how we draw organic molecules. Here I have a molecule called N-pentane, uh, which is a common solvent that's used uh, industrially as, as well as in research. The different ways that we can draw pentane are shown here. We can draw it as a dash formula where we explicitly label every single carbon and hydrogen, um, but most of the time we prefer to draw it in the simplified bond line formula where we assume that each of the points are carbons and that there's four connections to carbon at any given time. So the assumption is when we see the end of this line here, we assume that it's a CH3. When we see two lines coming from one spot, we assume that that's a CH2. 
and this is just uh, implicit hydrogens. The reason we do this is drawing in every single carbon and hydrogen often becomes tedious. Um, and for the most part, you'll find that carbons will have four bonds, that's single, double, or triple bonds, uh, towards uh, other carbons or other elements. Now, there are exceptions. So sometimes if we have a positive charge, the carbon can have only three connections, and that is drawn as a carbocation here. So this positively charged carbon only has three connections to three uh, CH3s, which we call methyl groups. We could also have a carbon ion. So instead of having a fourth connection, this carbon just has a net negative charge. Additionally, we can have a radical, uh, which is instead of having two extra electrons, it only has one. So it's neutral, but it's unpaired. And so this doesn't have a fourth uh, element bound to it. Finally, we can have um, this strange looking pair of dots, which we call a carbene. This is essentially two radicals that are on the same carbon. And so instead of having four connections, we can have only two, but these tend to be quite reactive. And so uh, aside from these cases, for the most part, carbon will have four connections. And so that is usually implicit in the structure. Now, when we have the carbon backbone, um, we're often able to decorate these molecules with various functional groups. So for the carbons, they can have single, double, or triple bonds to one another, as I alluded to earlier. And so one example here is butane. Butane and isobutane are often used in like cooking stoves as gases. Um, you can see that drawn in both the dash and the bond line formula. Here we have 2-butene, which is an alkene. We have also 2-butyne, which is an alkyne. And so you can see here that both of these carbons are sticking off of this double bond on the same direction, but you can also have different geometry for alkenes, which I will talk about in a later video. Sometimes when we talk about alkenes, uh, we will refer to them as olefins, um, or if something is connected to an alkene, we'll often refer to them as vinyl groups. Now, when it comes to alkynes, for the most part, people only refer to them as alkynes, but once in a while you'll see someone refer to them as an acetylene. And so sometimes different professors prefer to call them different things just depending on when they were trained. Alkanes in general tend to be referred to just as hydrocarbons or saturated hydrocarbons, whereas alkene and alkyne containing hydrocarbons tend to be referred to as unsaturated hydrocarbons because they could still have hydrogen added to them which would saturate them with hydrogen. That's what that means. Okay, now let's talk about some of the more interesting functional groups. So it's possible instead of having a carbon-carbon or a carbon-hydrogen bond, it's possible to have carbons bound to other elements such as oxygen. In this case here, I have one propanol drawn, which is a primary alcohol. When we have this one with, uh, with a degree symbol, that is a, a primary that indicates uh, whether it's primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. Once in a while, you'll see these alcohols be referred to as hydroxy groups or hydroxyl groups, but for the most part, we refer to them as alcohols. It's also possible to have a sulfur instead of an oxygen. If the sulfur has a hydrogen bound to it, we refer to that as a thiol. Um, these tend to be additives in natural gas so that leaks can be detected uh, or as uh, denaturants in other consumer products, so things you're not supposed to eat so that they smell bad. For the most part, these smell so bad, though, that they are only used when absolutely necessary. Occasionally, these are referred to as mercaptans. This is the older nomenclature. If we have a nitrogen forming a single bond to a carbon like this, we have an amine. This is a primary amine, and this would be called propylamine, aka propanamine. propanamine. If we only have one carbon connected, it's only a primary amine. If we have multiple, then we get to secondary and tertiary, which I'll talk about in a later slide. Finally, for this slide, uh, it's possible to have halogens, and so here I have a fluorine connected to carbon, and this we would call a fluoroalkane, or an alkyl fluoride. This is a primary alkyl fluoride, so you could imagine having uh, two carbons branching off of this position, but in this case this is only a primary fluoride, a primary alkyl fluoride. Um, these, for the most part, are the main elements that you see bound to carbon, uh, halogens including also chlorine, bromine, and iodine. But aside from that, in contemporary organic chemistry, it's very common to see boron, phosphorus, selenium, once in a while arsenic, uh, and as well as the halogens bound. But for the most part, aside from uh, transition metals and some other metals, 
these are the main things you'll see, and the metals tend to only exist as transient intermediates, uh, which is a bit of an oversimplification, but it should do for now. So instead of just having one carbon connected to an oxygen to form an alcohol, if we have a one oxygen with a carbon on either side, we call that an ether. And so here we have diethyl ether. Diethyl ether is a very common solvent that you'll use in your lab work. Um, if you're doing research, it's used extensively. Um, and a good way to remember what this is called is an ether because there's a carbon on either side. We also can have the equivalent functional group, but with a sulfur, and this is called a thioether. One useful thing to remember is if you have an oxygen containing thing, uh, but it's a sulfur containing thing instead, just call it the thio version of the oxygen thing. So a thio ether or a thiol, in, as the thiol was present in the previous slide. These tend to be very smelly compounds like rotting cabbage. Uh, we can have secondary amines, so a nitrogen with a carbon on either side. This is diethylamine, a common reagent in organic synthesis as a base or a nucleophile. It's also possible to have three groups coming off of the nitrogen. So this would be a tertiary amine, triethylamine, arguably the most common organic base in organic chemistry. It's also possible to add yet another group to the nitrogen, giving it a net positive charge. And in this case, uh, instead of calling it an amine, we call it an ammonium. And the eum indicates that it's positively charged. So this is a quaternary ammonium salt, tetraethyl ammonium. Typically, we have a counter ion present to balance out the positive charge, but I haven't drawn one here for simplicity. Now moving forward to compounds with uh, multiple bonds. So there's a class of functional groups called carbonyl containing compounds. Carbonyls are carbon double bond oxygens, and they form some of the most significant molecules in organic synthesis. They're very important motifs. So here we have an aldehyde. This is propanol. For three carbon systems, uh, instead of just calling them uh, propyl, sometimes they call them propionyl. And so older nomenclature will prefer the propion, but prop is okay for modern chemistry. Here we have a carboxylic acid. Instead of having a hydrogen sticking off of the carbonyl, we have an OH group, like an alcohol. But when we have this connected directly to a carbonyl, we call it a carboxylic acid. This would be called propanoic acid, or the old name would be propionic acid. If we put a carbon on that oxygen, instead of having an OH, if we have a CH3 group, for instance, we have an ester. And so this would be methyl propanoate or methyl propionate. Esters are very nice smelling compounds and they're also good solvents. So ethyl acetate is an example of a solvent that's used in nail polish remover. If we have a carbonyl with a carbon on either side, we call that a ketone. In this case, uh, we call that propanone, 2-propanone or propane 2 ohm this is more commonly referred to as acetone, which is an old name, but acetone is what most people will refer to this as. This is a great solvent, previously used more commonly in nail polish remover, but it's used in very, very many applications. Um, one other carbonyl containing compound is the amide, where instead of uh, a carbon here, we have one carbon and one NH2, a nitrogen. Uh, these tend to be useful solvents. Uh, amides are also present in amino acids. Uh, once they've formed peptides, uh, and so this is propanamide. It's a primary amide, and the old name would be propionamide. So it's possible, instead of having just a carbonyl, it's possible to have a nitrogen there. And sometimes when we're talking about organic molecules, uh, something that organic chemists like to do is abbreviate whatever the carbon-containing group is to an R group. So an R group just means it's something. It, we're not telling you what it is necessarily, but it's an abbreviated short form that makes it easier to see. Okay, so for these ones, they don't have compound names because we haven't defined what the compound is. We've given them just abstract uh, assignments. And so this is a methyl imine. An imine is just the equivalent of a carbonyl, but when it's formed to a nitrogen with something coming off of it. So this is a methyl imine. It would also still be an imine if um, we had another carbon on this side, but for simplicity, I've drawn this as a derivative of an aldehyde. So instead of an oxygen aldehyde, I've drawn it as uh, an imine of an aldehyde. Okay, if you instead take a different type of nitrogen containing compound with two uh, carbons, we would have an imenium. And so this has to be positively charged because otherwise uh, nitrogen likes to have three things connected to it. So it donates its lone pair in so that it can be positively charged. This is called an amenium. If we have an imine, but instead of a carbon coming off of the nitrogen, we have an OH, 
This is called an oxime. These are very useful synthetic intermediates. Um, and one final example here is a carbon triple bond nitrogen, which we call a nitrile. These are also referred to as cyanides. If you ever have uh, multiple R groups coming off, as I've drawn in this oxime here, um, it you just can add an apostrophe uh, and multiple apostrophes as you get more and more R groups. Um, some people prefer to use a superscript notation, so R1, R2, R3, but you should never use a subscript uh, like R3 down here because that's quite confusing. If we have like a CH3, that's when it would be appropriate to use a subscript for the three, but not for like various R groups because that can be really confusing. Um, additionally, if you're not interested in the chemistry here, if you ever like to cook food nice and crispy with a bit of oil, what happens is the sugars uh, in foods such as glucose, sucrose, etc., the free aldehydes are able to react with amino acids such as like uh, monosodium glutamate or whatever, uh, and they form imines when they're heated to very high temperatures when they drive off water. And so this crispy, delicious flavor that you get when you fry food uh, comes from the formation of imines uh, via a reaction called the Maillard reaction, or Maillard if you're uh, butchering it like an English person, Maillard. Okay, so moving beyond oxygen-containing uh, derivatives, it's possible to have sulfur-containing derivatives. So instead of just thioethers or thiols, it's possible to have more complex things. You probably won't encounter these too, too much early on in your organic chemistry experience, but I found that it's useful to have these identified at an early stage, just so you know what they're called when you're talking about them. If we have a sulfur with two S double bond O's and an OH, that's called a sulfonic acid. If we only have one of those S double bond O's, it's called a sulfinic acid. If instead of having the OH, we just have like another R group, some sort of carbon, that's called a sulfone. And if we have uh, just one S double bond O, that's called a sulfoxide. It's also possible to have sulfonamides. There's some more obscure sulfur containing functional groups, such as sulfenic acids, which are very unstable. Um, disulfides, which are very common in cysteine dimers in amino acid or peptide derivatives. Um, sulfoxemes, which are an emerging class of um, pharmaceutically relevant motifs. Uh, and sulfonates, which are used as good leaving groups, which we'll talk about in a future video. Now, if you're not interested in these, just think about how much you probably enjoy garlic or onions in your cooking. And so uh, when you cook and cut garlic, it forms something called allicin from an enzyme called allicinase. Uh, and this forms disulfide oxides, which cleave to form sulfenic acids. So, you know, not all sulfur is bad. Some of the best flavor that you get in cooking is derived from sulfur containing compounds. There's also some phosphorus derivatives that it would be worth knowing. So phosphenes are used as ligands uh, for metals, which is a topic that will be discussed much later. Um, but they're a common enough reagent uh, in their own right in organic synthesis. When we have one phosphorus with three things connected, we call that a phosphine. This is a tertiary phosphine. Um, primary and secondary phosphines exist, but they're far less commonly encountered. We often form phosphine oxides, which is just a uh, a phosphorus 5 derivative where we've added an oxygen to the phosphorus. Sometimes we see this group called a phosphite, which is a phosphorus with three oxygens connected to it with some sort of R group, such as trimethylphosphite, triethylphosphite. Um, and additionally, we can have phos phosphonic acids, phosphonates, and phosphates. These are uh, less commonly encountered, but phosphonates are occasionally encountered for uh, a few different reactions. Um, if you're interested in phosphonic acid derivatives, this glyphosate, which is ready roundup, um, this is uh, used as a crop herbicide, uh, and it's got a lot of bad press recently in the news. So another thing that's interesting is you can have linear or cyclic hydrocarbons. So you can have your you can have your carbon containing compounds in rings or in lines with branches without branches. Um, and so it's useful to know what these are called too. So if we have a ring, we call these cyclo, so cyclohexane, cyclopentane, cycloheptane, and the cyclo just tells you that it's a ring. It's also possible to have double bonds and triple bonds in a ring. And so here, this is the smallest cyclic alkyne, uh, which is otherwise hydrocarbon called cyclooctyne. And here you can see the ine indicates the alkyne. Another ring that you'll encounter a lot in organic chemistry is the benzene ring, 
which is usually drawn with three discrete double bonds, but these are actually in resonance, which is a topic we'll talk about later. And so some people prefer to draw the resonance form where all of the electrons are moving around. This form on the left is called the Kekulé structure. And this is how I would still say most organic chemists draw these. Uh, it's also possible to have rings containing other elements besides just carbon. So like we were talking about functional groups with nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus earlier, it's also possible to have rings uh, comprised of other uh, atoms in them as well. And so these are typically called heterocycles, even though they have their own discrete names. Um, you won't encounter them as much in early uh, organic chemistry, um, but they're useful to recognize because they're present in a lot of pharmaceuticals. Um, also, there's essentially an unlimited number of possible heterocycles that could exist. And so it's just a matter of us being creative to come up with new ones. And so here are some examples such as furan, tetrahydrofuran. It's called tetrahydro because they've added four hydrogens to the furan ring. This is called perol, thiophene, uh, one for dioxane, pyridine, oxazole, and thiazole. Um, and so uh, it's not too important to memorize all those, but they each have interesting names. And so I thought it would be useful here to go through an example that's relevant. So Claritin. Claritin is used as antihistamine. Uh, I would say it's relatively common where I'm from in Canada. Um, and so it has some interesting structural motifs, some functional groups that we're going to identify. So here we have a chlorine sticking off of this ring, which is a, called a benzene ring, which I just indicated a moment ago. This is called an aryl chloride. Aryl is a word that's used to indicate that there's a, a benzene ring connected to the thing we're talking about. So an aryl halide or an aryl alcohol, an aryl um, olefin or alkene. Um, I've also drawn this benzene ring in green to help identify it for you. You can see we also have the seven-membered ring here, which is a cycloheptane. You could count this double bond and this double bond in the cycloheptane, in which case you call it a cycloheptadiene with numbers indicating the position. Um, this funky looking ring here is called a pyridine ring and pyridines are quite common in biosynthesis, also in synthetic chemistry, medicinal chemistry more broadly. Uh, pyridine itself is used as a base. Here we have a double bond all on its own because there's four substituents. This is a tetrasubstituted alkene or tetrasubstituted olefin. Here we have a unique derivative, which is somewhere between an ester and an amide because it's an ester on one side and an amide on the other. And we call that a carbamate. So I got a couple more examples to do here. So here we have paracetamol. Uh, in North America, this is usually known as Tylenol or acetaminophen. Um, this is a relatively straightforward molecule because it only has two functional groups, really. It has this amide group and it has this alcohol group. But because this alcohol is connected to a benzene ring, we call this a phenol. Um, I didn't highlight the benzene ring here, but you can see that there's a benzene ring as well. One last example is frovatriptan. Triptans are a useful class of molecules for treating uh, really severe migraines uh, by targeting um, certain receptors in the brain that are serotonin uh, receptors. And so in this compound, you can see we have a primary amide. There's no other groups coming off, so it's primary. We have this green ring, which is highlighted. This is a derivative of benzene. Um, when we have a benzene fused to this perol, which is what this five-membered ring is called, when this whole thing is together, we call that an indole. And indoles are an important class of molecules present in drugs, a lot of biochemistry, such as in tryptophan. Um, and they're a motif that are worth knowing. Here we also have a cyclohexane ring. If we're counting this olefin, we'd call it a cyclohexene. Uh, and we also have a chiral, secondary amine. Chirality is a topic that I will cover in uh, an upcoming video. Here you can see that this like wedged notation just indicates that it's going into the plane of the page. Okay. And so with that, we're approaching the end of this video. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're wanting to get a bit more practice uh, with functional group identification, to look at these three molecules here and do your best to identify functional groups. Um, as this channel grows, uh, I'm willing to answer some comments uh, in the comment section if you have questions, specific things. Yeah, if there's an interest in the future, I'd be willing to do some sort of stream session on Twitch 
where we talk about how to solve certain questions. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to be focusing my efforts on uploading a series of videos that hopefully provide some help to you, the audience. And so thank you for watching. Uh, if you'd like, you could leave a like and subscribe. Uh, if you have any comments for this video format, I'd be happy to hear them. And yeah, thank you for your time.